All right. So once again, reminder, a week from today at night in Phillips 101, we have our first prelim. There are some people who have direct conflicts. I've been making special arrangements over email with them. And so uh, once again, please, if you're, one of the, if you're a person who has a problem with that time for whatever reason, get in touch with me ASAP. But anyway, uh, and it covers through, essentially through uh, the lecture last Thursday which is tantamount to chapters one through four in the book, okay? So if that's not clear, and the old pre the one from last fall is up, you can look at that, get an idea of what the prelim is gonna look like. Anyway, uh, but we're on to chapter five. Okay, so we started talking about what we called FIR systems, specifically where our focus so far has been on what I call causal FIR systems. And again, for those of you who weren't here last time, you never you don't pronounce this as an acronym FIR. You say FIR. That's the that's the word. Here's the general form of the IO relationship. Looks like this. Y of n. That's the output value at time n is going to be some linear combo of the values of the input signal x of n over a finite range leading up to time n. So y of n is a linear combo of x of n, x of n minus 1, so on. And I, want, I emphasized last time that the sliding window worldview, so to speak, is useful. You can visualize all the input signals values as arrayed out on a line and computing the output value at a given time is sliding a window along that line, looking at the input values in that window, taking a linear combo and getting the value of the output. And we talked about how these things worked in some specific examples. We saw that they sort of have a, a kind of a smoothing property and we looked specifically at finite duration signals <coughs> and their duration intervals or support intervals and remember that's terminology that differs a little bit from the book the book calls it support I call it support intervals and we talked about how these things operate on those and we, we observed in a kind of a loose way that when the input signal is finite duration, then so is the output signal. And the duration interval of the output is, in some sense, the sum of the duration intervals of the input and 0 to m. OK, we'll get more specific about that as we go along. All right. So let's pick it up. At the end of class last time, we talked about two special signals, the discrete time unit impulse delta of n and the discrete time unit step u of n. And after class, I got the usual complaints. I don't want to call them complaints, because um, that makes you sound like whiners. The usual observation that when I write u of n on the board, sometimes it looks like u of u. Sometimes it looks like n of n. Sometimes it looks like n of u, right? But I'm hoping that the context will make clear what I'm talking about. I, I'm not going to make some special, you know, kind of u to make for the unit step. So, but feel free to say, is that u of n or u of u? And, and I'll say, well, when did we ever talk about u of u? No, I'll say, that's u of n. I'll be polite when I answer the question. So, don't, don't be shy. All right? Okay, so discrete time impulse and discrete time unit step. Now, what happens when you say, when you put a unit step into one of these causal FIR systems? Okay, so let's see, use delta of n as the input to a causal FIR system. Let's call the output that arises h of n. And this is Another piece of notation that's going to persist throughout the course, 
what, what do we call, what, what's the name of this h of n? We call h of n the impulse response of the FIR system. OK, so if you think of this delta of n goes into the system, what comes out is h of n. And what's h of n going to be if the system is one of those guys, takes that general form? It's sum, sum from k equals 0 to n, bk delta of n minus k. Now, those of you who have taken circuits have probably heard the terminology impulse response in the context of circuits, correct? Any other courses have you seen impulse response or, or that kind of like Bryce? Diffy Q sort of? Yeah. OK, cool. Anyway, so, so we got this. That's the impulse response. And you can think of this impulse response as the result of a single special I.O. experiment on the system. In other words, system is sitting on the table. You come into the lab or whatever, and you, you know, at time zero, you just kick it. You know, you, you give it a 1 at time 0, and you just see what happens after that, right? That's one way of thinking of the impulse response. Now, it turns out that we can figure out the impulse response really explicitly for these causal FIR systems in terms of the Bs. So let's calculate h of n for various values of n. All right. First off, what is h of n when n is less than 0? Here's the formula for h of n. What if n, that's an n there, not a u. <laughs> what if n is less than 0? What is the value of h of n? Zero? Who said 0? How come? Why do you, why do you think it's 0? Yeah, and yeah, that, that's the point. The, the, the way I like to think of this sliding window, sliding window worldview, right? What is the delta? The delta is a little spike at time 0. OK, so this is the delta of n. This is time 0, and then at time 1, time 2, time 3, it's 0. And times before that, it's 0, right? So what happens when I? put the delta into this FIR system. Well, the window comes trekking along, right? And as long as the right-hand end of the window is to the left of time 0, it never includes the 1, right? And you can see that formally by proceeding as you suggested. What's your name, by the way? OK. Proceeding as you suggested by looking at the terms in this sum. Delta of n minus k, as k runs from 0 to n, is always delta of something negative, right? Delta of something negative is 0. So there's two ways of seeing that h of n is 0 when n is less than 0. One way is by using the sliding window. The sliding window with right hand edge n doesn't capture 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 the impulse when n is less than 0 and another way of seeing it is the the kind of the math way that when 0 is less than or equal to k less than or equal to n and n is less than 0 delta of n minus k is equal to delta of something negative is equal to 0. So all the terms in the sum giving you y of n are 0 when n is less than 0. OK, so that's, that's something. Now what about, how about when n is bigger than cap m? Oh, this should be a cap m up here. Everybody? 
I don't think the camera caught that. <laughs> well, caught the, fixed it. So here, that was a mistake on the board. There's a cap M at the top of that sum, okay? Everybody? All right, so what happens when little n is bigger than cap M? It's kind of the same argument in reverse. You have a window of length m plus 1 whose left-hand edge is at n minus little n minus cap m. And when little n gets bigger than cap m, that window does not include 0. So h of n is also 0 when n is bigger than cap m. So similarly, h of n is 0 when n is bigger than cap m. How come? You look at the terms in the sum when 0 is less than or equal to k is less than or equal to m, and n is bigger than cap m, delta of n minus k is equal to delta of something bigger than 0. And that is going to be 0. So all the terms in the sum are 0. When n is bigger than m. OK. So big surprise, del h of n, the impulse response, has finite duration. Now, that's not a big surprise, because we observed last time that if you put a finite duration signal into one of these sy systems, you get a finite duration signal out. But let's pause. So thus, in particular, h of n has finite duration. And guess why we call the system an FIR system? That's why we call the system FIR. So finite duration impulse in plus impulse response. That's where the name comes from. And really, you know, I've always wished it was instead of calling them FIR, they call them FDIR. But people are picky. They say, oh, no, finite duration, that's a hyphenated word, so it's one word, so we're going to call it FIR. But, but FDIR doesn't tempt you to say a stupid acronymal pronunciation of this word. It doesn't tempt you to say FDIR, FDIR, or anything like that. Second of all, finite impulse response. Well, of course, the impulse response is finite. You know, you put in an impulse, you get out a nice signal with finite values. What's finite about it is its duration, not it. <laughs> so sure, I'm being picky, but whatever. That's where the name comes from. All right, finally, so, we, so now we know that the impulse response act is active only between 0 and m inclusive. What is it there? So finally, When n is between 0 and cap m inclusive, okay. so when n is neither less than 0 nor bigger than cap m, what is h of n? Let's look at the sum. The sum defining h of n has, at most, one non-zero term. And you can think window, sliding window if you want. There's one place in the window where you get something non-zero. Or you can think mathematically. You can look at the sum and you can say, well, bk delta of n minus k, when n is not equal to k, that's delta of something non-zero. OK, so it looks like this. This is the k equals n term. That is to say, h of n is going to equal like a bunch of zeros 
plus b sub n delta of 0 plus, plus 0. Finite number of zeros. But this is when n minus k equals 0, or n equals k, if you will. k equals n. Bottom line. is that h of n is equal to b sub n when 0 is less than or equal to n, less than or equal to m. And we can summarize this whole discussion so far as follows. H of n is equal to b sub n when n is between 0 and cap m and 0 otherwise. That's the impulse response of this system. Okay. Now, what's cool about this is not only is the impulse response determined completely by the Bs, the Bs are determined completely by the impulse response. If someone came up to you on Hope Plaza and said, hey, I have a system that has such and such an impulse response, can you write down its IO relationship? You would just say, yeah. OK, so let's think about this for a second. Thus, quote unquote, knowing h of n for all n, is the same as, quote unquote, knowing all the Bs, all the BKs, right? Which is the same as knowing everything about the system from an IO standpoint. Because Because the Bs are that. In other words, the Bs tell you how the system reacts to any input. And what's surprising, perhaps surprising, about this is, remember, I characterized the impulse response earlier as the result of a single I.O. experiment that you do on the system. Come up to the system at time 0, hit it with a 1, and see what happens. Doing that one experiment is enough to figure out what the output of any I.O. experiment on the system is going to be. And so that's kind of surprising, maybe. Maybe it's surprising, maybe not. So, so philosophically speaking, the result of a single <coughs> I.O. experiment, if you will, on a system It's something that you're, you, know, you would do if you were a kid. You, you come into a room and you're a kid, you see a box with a red button on it. What do you do? <laughs> Push the button, right. You come in, you see a, a system sitting on the table, you, you hit it, right? Just hit it and watch and see what happens. You don't, you don't sort of manipulate it with some kind of elaborate scheme. But the result of this single special I.O. experiment on the system determines the results of all possible I.O. experiments on the system. And we can make that determination explicit by just substituting h in for the b's in the expression that gives you y in terms of x, namely in terms of equations. So equation-wise. y of n equals the sum from k equals 0 to cap m of bk x of n minus k. That's the same as y of n 
equals the sum from k equals 0 to cap m h of k x of n minus k. So if someone came up to you in Hope Plaza and told you the impulse response h of n and said, what is the IO relationship for the whole system, you would be able to tell them what it is. It's this. Knowing the impulse response is the same as knowing everything about the system. And that's an important fact. And to me, it's surprising a priori. OK, so, so y you want to figure out the impulse responses of a few systems, just, just for practice, like some of our example systems? Why not? I, I shouldn't ask those rhetorical questions, because one of these days someone is going to say, no, that's so boring. Let's not do it. Um, <clears throat> so some impulse responses of example systems. How about the, the trivial ones that we started with? The zero system and the identity system. So what the zero system, what is the impulse response? H of n equals, all right, think about it this way. The impulse response is what comes out of the system when we put an impulse into it, right? So what comes out of the zero system when we put an impulse into it? <coughs> so, sorry? The zero signal, right? Because the zero signal comes out of the zero system no matter what input we put into it. So h of n is the zero signal. How about the identity system, the one that, that you proposed last time, you know, the system that does nothing to the input? If I put a delta into a system that does nothing to the input, that passes it unadulterated, what comes out? The delta. The delta. H of n equals delta of n. Cool. How about the pure n1 shift? Remember what that system did? That system takes any input x of n and shifts it to x of n minus n1. So what does it do to a delta? Yeah, delta of n minus n. Be, be, be brave, folks. Just jump in, and then we'll get to the harder ones. Delta of n minus n1. A shifted impulse. All right. What about the averager system? Hmm. What about the averager system? And here, this one, the easier thing to do is to, is to look at the formula for the IO relationship for the averager system and, and figure out what h of n is from that thing at the top of board number 2, or board beta, or whatever you think of that board as. So the averager system, we had this y of n equals 1 over m plus 1, sum from k equals 0 to m of x of n minus k. OK, so this is, we figured out the b's for this system last time, the b k's. So we saw last time that b k is equal to 1 over m plus 1 when k is between 0 and m, inclusive, and 0 otherwise. And by our mapping from b's to h's, we find that h of n, the impulse response of the system, is equal to 1 over m plus 1 when n is between 0 and m, and 0 otherwise. And you could do that by hand, too, just by sliding the window along and capturing the impulse and seeing what goes on there. And by the way, over the course of the semester, 
this kind of thing, this kind of like pulsy kind of discrete time signal is going to come back again and again and again. We'll, we'll see it in, you know, it's going to have an interesting DTFT. It's going to be, you know, what you see everywhere. Okay. Finally, there was another system we talked about that was not a causal FIR system. And so technically it doesn't fit under this umbrella of H's and stuff, but I just want to talk about it anyway because it's kind of cool. And that was the discrete time integrator. So what about the discrete time integrator? A discrete time integrator was the system that gave you this as the output. when x is the input. It's the sum of all the pass values of x. So this is not FIR, all caps, but we can still find its impulse response, h of n. What happens when I put an impulse into a discrete time integrator? Anybody care to hazard a guess before we, we grind it out? Think. Y at time n is the sum of all the past values of x. What happens when x is an impulse, Jade? The delta for all n bigger than or equal to zero, maybe. Yeah. 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 We, we have a name for that. Yeah, unit step, u of u, n of n, n of u, u of n. OK, that is the correct answer. So it turns out h of n is equal to u of n. How come? Well, the rationale, which I think underlay your suggestion, is the following. For any time n, h of n is the sum of all the past values of the input up through time n. When n is less than 0 and the input is a delta, all those past values are zeros. So you're summing up zeros. When n hits 0, all of a sudden you've got a 1 in there, right? So h of 0 is going to be 1. It's going to be 1 plus infinity zeros. And similarly, when n is equal to 1, you're summing up all the values of x of n through time 1. That will include the delta. So again, you're going to get a 1 n equals 2, again, you're going to get a 1, and so on. So you're going to get 1 when n is bigger than or equal to 0, and 0 when n is less than 0, because when n is bigger than or equal to 0, sum of all the past values of x includes the delta. When n is less than 0, it doesn't. So when n is bigger than or equal to 0, quote unquote, sum of past x values includes the delta of 0 value. And when n is less than 0, it doesn't. All right, so that was, that's the result of figuring out the impulse response for all these example systems. Now, the sum, let's go back to our formula. So back now to the formula, the IO formula in terms of the impulse response. We, it was this, y of n is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to m h of k x of n minus k. Because h of n, the impulse response, is 0 when n is less than 0 and when n is bigger than cap m, and let me write it this way. When h of k is 0, when k is less than 0, 
n when k is bigger than m, we can, for whatever reason, we can rewrite this as an infinite sum. And you know, this is something like you never want to do in real life, is take, take a finite sum and rewrite it as an infinite sum. Why make your life harder? Well, it turns out it enables us to fit this whole theory under an umbrella, a math umbrella, involving a special kind of binary operation on signals called, what do you think it's called? Is that formula at all kind of quasi-familiar to you? Yes. What is your? It reminds you of integration. It, yeah, it reminds me of integration, too. So how, how would it look? An integral it would form it would look something like this, like h of tau x of t minus tau d tau, right? Does that remind you of something? Is the, has that ever been named? Yes. Critique, what is it? Don't Sorry? Don't you don't remember? Well, <laughs> it's called convolution. OK, and it's a very convoluted thing. And we're going to have to talk about it. Does that sound right? Does that ring a bell? No. People have not. Jordan, you heard about it sometime or other, right? Where, where did you hear about it? CS majors actually do math? They, they do math physics. What's that? They math physics. Oh, math physics. Oh, so you, you didn't just take CS classes. No, OK. So Bruce Cussey, does he still teach that class? Legendary course at Cornell. Yeah, convolution. This, the terminology for this form, this is discrete time convolution. And the thing I wrote up there and, and quickly erased is continuous time convolution. And so we're going to take a little detour and talk just for a few minutes about convolution. So this, the form of this expression, this expresses y of n as what's called the convolution of h of n. And here, I don't know what to write. I can either write and or with. So I'm going to say with x of n. But some people you know, might be rigid about their grammar, their math grammar. And they might insist that you don't use an of there. And, and you know, no, you shouldn't say convolution of h with x. You should say convolution of h and x. That's the way to do it. But the same person would come up to you and say, well, say we have h and x and we convolute them. That's wrong. Okay? The verb is to convolve. Okay? To convolve. You convolve things. You don't convolute them. So really, that kind of popular expression, you know, oh my god, his explanation was just so convoluted, that's wrong. You should really say his explanation was really convolved. That's what you should say. But no one would say that. Anyway. All right, so here's a slight detour. So short detour. Let's talk about convolution for a few minutes. Given two signals, h of n and x of n, they are convolution. And I'm just going to stick to h of n and x of n rather than some general form x1 of n, x2 of n, q of n, r of n. So given two discrete time signals, h of n and x of n. And by the way, these are not necessarily finite duration. They're just any two signals. Their convolution, y of n, let's call it, it exists. And I want to give you a caution here that two arbitrary signals are not necessarily convolvable with each other. They have to satisfy certain things. It turns out that's not an issue in finite duration land. And so I'm going to talk about the non-existence of convolution a little bit more later, so more later on this. Their convolution y of n 
if it exists, is the signal with specification y of n is equal to the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity h of k x of n minus k. All right, so that's the definition. Y is a signal. H and, and X are signals. So convolution is an operation that takes two whole signals and gives you another whole signal. So convolution is an operation that takes two whole signals and gives you another whole signal. And as such, it's something a mathematician might call a binary operation on signal space. Okay, you, you look in the space of all signals and here's some binary operations, addition, multiplication, whatever. This is another one. Two whole signals taken together give you another whole signal. <laughs> Notation-wise, we write this. This is our common notation. And this is, this notation, in my opinion, is somewhat unsatisfactory. And here's where the book, it, it, I, I'll complain in a second. OK, notation, unsatisfactory. Y of n equals h of n with a little star and then x of n. So you read this as, quote unquote, y of n is h of n convolved with x of n, or y of n is, is the convolution of h of n with x of n, blah, blah, blah. You know, you could read that any way you want. Now, why is this unsatisfactory? It's unsatisfactory because it doesn't, it doesn't embody correctly, in my opinion, the fact that convolution takes two whole signals gives you another whole signal. Because this makes it look kind of like for each n, the value of y at time n depends only on the values of x and h at time n. That's not the case. OK, so this is deceptive because it doesn't quite fit. And it, it's the same thing about x, go, x of n going in, y of n coming out of a system, saying that's not a satisfactory notation because it makes it look like the system has no memory. So it, it's just deceptive. It looks as if y at any time n, so specific n, depends only on x at that same n and h at that same n. OK, so one step in the grown-up notation direction here would be, so this is better, would be y of n equals h convolved with x of n. OK, that's a little better. Because that makes it clear somehow that h convolved with x is a thing that involves all of h and all of x. And its value at time n is the same as the value of y of n. Best would be y equals h convolved with x. You just refer to signals by their letter and don't put an of anything after them. And this is the kind of notation that we use in EC 3250. We, we, get, we go into the grown-up notation world where we think of x as a whole signal, h as a whole signal, and y as a whole signal you get by doing something to those two whole signals. And oddly, in my opinion oddly, the book, when they, when they, the book has a little like uh, kind of a rumination on this whole thing. They say, you know, that this, this isn't such great notation because it makes it look like y of n just depends on blah, blah, blah. You know, it would be better if we wrote this. And I'm like, OK, then why didn't you write the book that way, right? Anyway, you can actually find that, that little rumination. So anyway, that's, that would be a better notation for convolution. Now, there's a couple things to observe, then we'll take the three-minute break. First thing to observe is 
And these are all easy to, to prove, so I'm not going to stand up here and go through a, a line by line argument for these things. So it's easy to show that. OK, so let's start the list. First off, it turns out that convolution is quote unquote commutative in the following sense. And I hope you've all heard this word before. I, I know I grew up in the, when, when I had fifth grade math, there was something called the new math. It was like an experiment on kids. And I was one of the first guinea pig classes to have this experiment done on me. And we learned all this complicated adult math stuff, you know, commutative, associative, distributive, at a very early age. Did you guys learn this at some age or other? Commutative just means that you can do it in either order, and it comes out the same. In this case, what I mean by commutative is that when you write the sum out, it doesn't matter who gets the k and who gets the n minus k, right? If you give h the k and x the n minus k, you get the same thing as if you give h the n minus k and x the k. So it doesn't, in the sense that y of n equals the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity h of k, x of n minus k, turns out to be exactly the same as the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity h of n minus k, x of k i.e., it doesn't matter who gets the k and who gets n minus k. And you may say, OK, well, cool, who cares? It turns out that sometimes it's, it's easier to evaluate the sum if you do it one way than it is if you do it the other way. OK, so that's one thing that's true about convolution. And, and you prove this just by simple changing indexes of summation. All right. Second thing is, actually, let's let's do the three-minute break now, and then we'll then we'll do the second thing. All right. So so this is this is good. This is a good property of of convolution. All right. And furthermore, convolution is associative. In the sense that, suppose I had, say, two h's and an x. If, if I took uh, h1 of n and I convolved that with the convolution of h2 of n and x of n, I get the same thing I would have gotten if I, take, if I took h1 and h2 and first convolved those guys and then convolved that result with x. And this is going to come up a little bit later on. We talk about cascading systems and whatever. But anyway, it's associative in that sense. And it distributes over addition. OK, it distributes. And more generally, so convolution distributes over linear combos. E.g., so something like this. If I had h of n and I convolve that with c1x1 of n plus c2x2 of n, I get c1h convolved with x1 of n. Plus c2, h convolved with x2 of n. So all the good stuff, you know, all the, all the things you wish were true are true, OK, about convolution. All right, so, so now um, let's, let me just see if there's anything else I want to say in general about convolution. Oh, yeah, there is something important. Convolution, as I said, is a binary operation on signal space. It's something you take one signal, another signal, you get, you you get another a third signal. And when you have a binary operation on any set, 
the question arises of whether there's an identity element associated with that binary operation. Have you heard that expression before, identity element? So like for square matrices, square matrix multiplication, there's an identity element, the identity matrix, right? You take the identity matrix, multiply it by any other matrix, you get the matrix back. Is there an identity element for convolution? Is there some special signal that when you convolve it with any x, you just get x back again? Anybody care to hazard a guess to that question? Yeah, Apu? You know, you're just sticking your pen in the air? You're not offering an answer? You just think that's what you think. OK, cool. Yes? The unit step. No, actually, it's not. What's your, what's your next guess? OK, the, he, his guess would be all ones or the unit step. I go in the other direction from the unit step. Delta, yes. OK, you were going to say delta, I know, because Yes, delta of n, it turns out, is the identity element for convolution. The unit impulse delta of n is n, or the identity element, for convo in the sense that if you take a delta and you convolve it with any x, you get x back. So in the sense that for any signal x of n, delta of n convolved with x of n equals x of n all over again. And this is one that, that is easy to prove, like in one line. So I'm going to do it on the board, you know? So why? Let's just write the sum. Let's let y of n equal delta n convolved with x of n. Then, just by definition of the convolution, y of n is the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity delta of k x of n minus k. Now that ostensibly infinite sum has at most one non-zero term, right? Because delta is 0 everywhere except at k equals 0. So only the k equals 0 term can be non-zero because the delta is 0 everywhere except k equals 0. So this is the same as dot, 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 a bunch of zeros plus delta of 0, x of n minus 0, plus a bunch of zeros after that. And delta of 0 is just 1. x of n minus 0 is just x of n. Bottom line is y of n is x of n. So delta is an identity element for convolution. Good thing to know. OK, so that's the end of the little detour on convolution. And now let's go back to, to these FIR systems. And I won't write down end of detour as a, as a LaTeX command, whatever. I'll just say you know, end of short detour because I don't want the error, uh, to, to get an error message on the lecture saying that you know begin lecture is ended by end detour, you know, something like that. All right. Okay, so now we're back to causal FIR systems. What we've seen now is 
that there's two ways of looking at the impulse response. For, uh, for, certainly, it tells us everything there is to know about the system, right? But here's, here's something, here's a picture I like to keep in my mind. Okay, so here's two ways to view the impulse response h of n of one of these systems. Okay, one view is like this. It's the response to an impulse. In other words, if, if the system is the box and you put a delta of n into it, what comes out is h of n. So it's the response to an impulse. And what is the other way that I like to view it? It's this. If you put any x of n into the system, what happens inside this box I'll make the box a little bigger, is that x of n gets convolved with h of n to give you y of n. In other words, h of n is, quote, what you convolve with inputs to get outputs. OK, so two different ways of thinking of the impulse response. It's the response to an impulse, or it's what you can evolve with inputs to give you outputs. So the, the, those are equivalent things, but it doesn't, it's not obvious to me that they should be the same. You know, we, we had to prove that. And, and this, in turns out, is going to be true for a more general class of systems that we're going to turn to in a moment. But the point is, you can think of h of n as being like coded into the system or wired into the system. And what's happening in this box is whatever input you put in is getting operated on by that code, that h of n code. And what comes out is h of n convolved with f of x of n. All right. OK, now it turns out, like I said a minute ago, this is going to be true of a uh, class of systems more general than just causal FIR systems. And so now what I want to do is I want to consider those. All right, so this turns out to be to be useful, true, whatever for a broader class of systems that we're going to introduce now. And these are called discrete time linear time invariant and this is one that everyone always just uses the letters for. They just say LTI. If you, if you hear someone talking about LTI anything, that's what they're talking about. It's not like the name of a conglomerate or something. And there's, there's no way to pronounce that. LTI, you know, whatever. Systems. OK. And it turns out that this is indeed a broader class of systems in the sense that every causal FIR system is one of these. But we're going to show that. OK, so what does it mean for a system, a discrete time system? So a system, remember, system is an entity that takes input signals and gives you output signals. So this is the most general like format of a system, It's something like that, it's some box. A system is linear when the following is true. For any signals x1 of n and x2 of n, and any constants c1 and c2,
if we have that x1 goes in and y1 comes out, and we also have that x2 goes in and y2 comes out, then if I put The linear combo x of n equals c1 x1 of n plus c2 x2 of n in. What comes out is the same linear combo of the y's that came out from the individual x's. That's what linearity is. It's just what you would expect. How about time invariance? So it's time invariant when, and there's lots of ways of doing this, and it's easier to do if you're using the grown-up notation of EC3250, but I have a way of doing it that the book doesn't quite do, so this is going to be a look, a look, look a little different from the book's description of time invariance. Okay, when the following is true. For any input signal, x of n, and any time shift, so integer, n0, say, if we have that x of n goes in and y of n comes out, and we set v of n to be the signal x of n minus n0, then if we take that signal, v of n, and put it into the system, the output signal w of n will be y of n minus n0. So in other words, the, the book doesn't do the VW thing. I do the VW thing for reasons that you'll see later on when you do a homework problem or two trying to figure out whether a system is time invariant. You know, you, you get, your head gets all messed up about, OK, what, do I change all the n's to n minus n zeros? Or just this one? Or you know, I, I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. You're not, you don't have to believe me. You know, you'll understand why when you do the problems. OK, so what is the kind of on the street slang for time invariance? It's if you shift the input by some amount, then the output shifts by the same amount. So quote unquote shift input implies that the output shifts by the same amount. And if, if you want, you can think of this as, say, you know, if, you're, if you think about things in a lab, like a box in a lab, a circuit box, or whatever discrete time thing. If you came in, in on day one and did some experiment on this box, right, and then you came in on like day seven and did the same experiment on the box, you get the same results. Because all you've done de facto is shift the input by seven days. And so the output doesn't shift. So what does that mean? In some sense, the box doesn't change while you're not looking at it, right? You know, you leave it in the room. It doesn't change over time. So that's what's time invariant about the system that the way it processes inputs doesn't change over time. OK, so that's what time invariance is. Now, as it happens, remember I said this is a broader class of systems. Causal FIR systems are LTI. So here's a fact. Causal FIR systems are indeed LTI. 
Not surprising. All right, now it's pretty easy to see that they're L, right? If I write up, say, y of n equals sum from, and I'm going to go back to the b notation for, for the moment because that makes it a little easier. If I write it this way, it's pretty easy to see that if I plug in C, C1x1 plus C2x2, then what happens when I put that signal in is C1 times what happens when I put the x1 in plus C2 when I put the x2 in. So linearity is pretty easy to see. I, what I want to do now, I want to look at time invariance. And I want to do the VW thing, just to show you how that works. Okay. So how about time invariance? Let's look at that. All right. So say this is true. y of n is the output signal when x goes in. I'm going to let n0 be given and v of n equal to x of n minus n0. What happens when I put v of n into the system? So v of n as input gives rise to output signal. w of n equals what? Well, it's going to be the sum from k equals 0 to m b k v of n minus k. That's how the system operates. It takes whatever the input signal is, takes bk it of n minus k, sums those from k equals 0 to cap m, gets output at time n. OK, let's look at what v of n minus k is. What is v of n minus k? v of anything. is x of anything minus n0. So since v of whatever, and we could even put a person in here. We could say v of Alex, right, is the same as v of Alex minus n0. So v of whatever equals x of whatever minus n0. What that means is that w of n the thing I get when I put in v of n is equal to the sum from k equals 0 to cap m of bk x of, and now the whatever is n minus k. So it's n minus k minus n0. And if I regroup that a little bit, No, n minus n0 minus k. What is this? This is just y of n minus n0. Because y of whatever is sum from k equals 0 to m, bk, x of whatever minus k. So this is because, so the last equality is because y of, and now I'm not even going to write out whatever. I'm going to put in like a, a blob. y of blob equals sum from k equals 0 to cap m bk x of blob minus k, whatever blob is. All right, now that's a really tedious demonstration that what comes out when you put in the v is the same shift of y as v was a shift of x. And that's the definition I gave for time invariance. And it's tedious because it took many steps. But if you just 
start plugging in n minus n zeros here and there, and it gets confusing, in my opinion. So do the VW thing or, or appreciate the value of it when you actually try to do a problem. All right, so causal FIR systems are linear time invariant systems. Now, a cool property of all LTI systems, at least reasonably well-behaved ones, is the following. It's something I mentioned earlier, and that is that the impulse response, again, is not only the response to an impulse, but it's what you can involve with inputs to give you outputs. That's a general fact that's true for all LTI systems. So here's a general fact that applies, and I, I shouldn't really say all. I'll say all. No, you know, I don't want to say all reasonable because that kind of impugns the reasonableness of a whole class of systems. So all sufficiently well behaved, let's say. So that's not really impugning a system when I say it's not well behaved. So here's a general fact that applies to all sufficiently well-behaved LTI systems, and that is the following, that the system's impulse response H of n, again, as for FIR systems, is what you can evolve with inputs to give you outputs. That is to say, for any admissible input in a signal x of n, I'll just say for any x of n, the output signal that arises is going to be just the convolution of h of n with x of n. So that's a fact for essentially arbitrary LTI systems. It's not just true for causal LTI systems. Ca I mean, causal FIR systems. All right, why does this hold? There's lots of ways to prove this. And, and I'm going to go through one that <laughs> I hope it's not too confusing. It's, it's kind of like what the book does, but it's a little different. All right. And it illustrates explicitly where linearity comes in and where time invariance comes in. And I'm not going to finish this today. I'm going to start it. I'm just going to draw a couple of pictures up because we're getting close to the end of class. So <clears throat> how to see this? All right. Well, first off, what happens when I put delta of n into the system? What comes out? Nick. Tell me what comes out. Yes, h of n. I knew you were just scratching your ear, but I decided to pick on you. OK, h of n. h of n is the response to an impulse, OK? What if I take, uh, say, delta of n minus 1 and I put that in? What comes out? No, I'm not going to let you answer now because <laughs> I already picked on you. Someone else tell me. Remember, the system is LTI. So we're going we're to be using L and we're, we're going to be using TI. Jack? H of n minus 1. H of n minus 1. Excellent h of n minus 1. 
So this is because ti. And similarly, you know, you, you shift h by any value that's going to, delta by any value, that's going to shift h by the same value, et cetera. OK, now, this picture here, this picture, these are all whole signal in, whole signal out. I want to emphasize that. OK? Each line here, namely this line, this line, this line, reads, quote unquote, whole signal in, whole signal out. So you put a whole delta function. That's something that has a 1 at time 0 and zeros before that. That's an input signal. You put that in the system. Out comes the whole signal h. You put a shifted delta. That's 0 for time bigger, less than 1, 1 for time bigger than 1, and 1 at time 1. You put that whole signal in the system. Out comes the whole signal h of n minus 1, and so on. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the time invariance does this. And by the way, it goes up in the other direction too. Delta of n plus 1, h of n plus 1. We're going to take a linear combination of these and use L to figure out what happens when I put an arbitrary x in. But we'll have to save that for next time.